All right, it's about a minute past one now and a number of participants have started to study. Uh, so we'll just get things rolling here. Um, so for anybody just joining us, welcome. Um, this is the Elms of Eastern Canada and the Northeastern United States webinar with Owen Clarkin. Uh, my name's Olivia Foster. I'm the communications coordinator with the Ontario Woodlot Association, and I'll be moderating tonight's session. Um, so with that, I will introduce our speaker, Owen Clarkin. Owen grew up near Russell, Ontario, and has been studying the trees of Eastern Ontario as a dedicated amateur since childhood. His interests are focused on uncommon native species, restoration of extirpated species to local areas, tracking invading exotic tree species and new pest slash diseases. Observation of trees are posted publicly, primarily to the citizen scientist platform iNaturalist, and that would be many of Owen's observations. Tree identification techniques are also a special interest of his. While exploring the wild growing trees of Eastern Ontario, particular attention has been given to the elms, especially rock elm and slippery elm, which we'll dive into more detail tonight, um, as well as the spruces, especially red spruce. Uh, those interested in learning more about red spruce in Eastern Ontario can watch a recording of Owen's presentation from the 2023 Kempville Winter Woodlock Conference this past February. Uh, we'll also include the link in the chat below later on this evening. Um, and members of the Ontario Woodlot Association can also read more about red spruce in the fall 2023 issue of the Ontario Woodlander. Owen's main affiliation is with the Ottawa Field Naturalist Club, and he's the current vice president and chair of the Conservation Committee. Um, so thank you, Owen, for, for coming back and, and delivering another webinar with us tonight. Uh, we're looking forward to, to learning more about Elms and seeing what you have to, to share with us all. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll just start sharing my screen. Perfect. So uh, um, there you go. That's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Looks good, hopefully. Will you? Okay, yes. cool. We'll just get started then. So hi, everybody. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, I'll try to give you all your money's worth in terms of a lot of content. So this is being recorded for, I think, eventual posting on YouTube. So we'll uh, just go through a lot of information here. Uh, quite visual. Um, I'm a visual learner, probably primarily, I think. So uh, hopefully other people can get something out of uh, seeing a lot of different kinds of images of these trees as well. Um, okay, so what we're looking at here on this title page, I think this was in the advert for the talk. On the left here, you, you can see my cursor too, Olivia, right? Okay, good. So on the left here, you've got uh, rock elm, which is our probably our least common elm species in our region that's native. At the center, you've got American elm. And on the right, you've got slippery elm. And hopefully those look somewhat different to you. We'll explore how they look different in more detail as we get going. Okay, I'm just going to start off actually with some basic resources, which I find useful and just uh, kind of outline them. Because I've noticed a lot of the older literature is often... Uh, in my opinion, higher quality, more accurate anyway. So there, you know, it won't incorporate modern information because of virtue of being published maybe years or decades ago. But I think the standard for publication was often higher in decades past, maybe up until around 1970s or 80s. So I'm just going to throw some uh, references out there that I like, and I could talk all night even about the references that I find useful. But anyways, so the Silvix Manual, uh, which is, I think, available online still as a uh, public service of the United States government, uh, I highly recommend checking it out. Uh, good information about uh, all the trees of North America. There's a volume one on uh, uh, softwoods or coniferous trees as well, and volume two is on the hardwoods. It covers the elms rather well. Uh, starting with historical documents, I'm just going to mention to you, uh, years back, I noticed on Google that you could download uh, many, many old books, including these interesting forestry reports from the late 1800s. So on the left here, we've got forestry report from American Forestry Congress, 1882, report on necessity of preserving and replanting forests, 1883, forestry report, 1884. Of course, roughly in, in our region, Eastern Ontario anyway, for those of you who are attending from Eastern Ontario, most of the deforestation that would have occurred here was uh, from roughly 1830 to 1900. And these reports reflect essentially uh, public consciousness that something 
<laughs> profound when maybe kind of bad was happening in terms of certainly uh, the resource depletion, but also I think a conservation ethic was starting to be formed as well. So I'm just going to show you two. There's one from 1885, 1886, 1887 and eight, and 1889, 90 and 91. And if you read all those, that's roughly a thousand pages of content and much interesting primary evidence regarding what our original forests looked like in Ontario. Some books that I find interesting too and useful, Textbook of Dendrology, certainly the older editions. This is the fifth edition publisher in 1970. Excellent book, like a real true textbook of forests of Eastern uh, North America. Actually, actually, this is Eastern and Western North America. So that's that's a really good resource if you can find it. There's newer editions of it, which I don't think are published by the same really two authors anymore. Kind of, it just sort of keeps going. I have no comment on that because I don't have a copy of that to see. On the right here is a, a photograph of... Uh, uh, Richens uh, Elm, which is a very highly recommended book by me. It's written from a, a United Kingdom perspective, but it, it's just full of history, lore, facts, uh, human uses, etc. And after reading this book, my conclusion is elms are pr probably the, one of the most, they're definitely one of the most important trees to human civilization in the Northern Hemisphere, maybe second only to oaks. And uh, so if you can track that down, highly recommend it. A couple of things I find uh, worth checking out. New England Trees in Winter, published in 1911. Just very excellent, factual, good photographs from over 110 years ago. Uh, if you can track that down, an excellent one. On the right here, this tree, my cursor, is an American chestnut. And of course, chestnut blight started uh, in the United States around 1904 and probably hadn't really reached New England, at least in terms of being there for any length of time by 1911 when this book was published. On the left is a white oak. The Canadian Naturalist from 1840 has interesting, uh, you know, kind of very, very early on comments on American elm and some other uh, flora and fauna of North America. Trees by Julia Rogers. There's an amazing photograph I'm going to say or maybe a painting of an American elm in this book it's gigantic tree if you can find that I recommend checking out the book that's from 1917 Rogers book uh, three more and then we'll get into the content so trees of southeastern United States this book has all the elms that we're going to cover tonight that are native to our region the three and also all the elms in North America and North of Mexico which is six total and well done with uh, you know high quality in terms of factual content on the photos and the descriptions the descriptions are a little bit light but they're they're good if you've never seen uh, this center book here, Natural History of Trees of Eastern and Central North America by P.T., highly recommended. This is basically essays on all the trees of North America. There's a Western version as well uh, from someone who is very insightful and offers a lot of content from the mid 20th century. And the trees of Florida was recently dropped off to me by a friend of mine, Bill Watt. And I found it really good actually. And it, it does cover several of our elm species, American and slippery, and also the South Southeastern ones, cedar and winged. Uh, I'm just going to make the point that many Canadian trees are threatened or endangered, and this is just one of a few articles on the subject. This was published about 15 years ago now, but showed that, uh, you know, around half of our species in Canada, 52%, require some kind of active conservation measures, and I can tell you that the situation has not gotten better since 2006. So what are the elms? Well, uh, they are trees of the North Temperate Zone, deciduous trees. They have a strong association with humans since antiquity. And in my opinion, and I think it's more than just an opinion, they seem to just be factually defining the landscapes of pastoral agricultural regions, at least until fairly recently with the onset of Dutch elm disease. Um, in terms of the association with humans, um, that book by Richens, the one that was titled Elm, goes into great detail about how English elm is not even from England. It was brought north probably by the Romans from the Iberian Peninsula and goes into great detail about how it seems not to be native. It doesn't really flower regularly because the frost killed the flowers, et cetera, et cetera. And it just sort of shows how uh, the Romans and other ancient peoples were already using elms in uh, for all sorts of uses, uh, wood, fodder for, uh, you know, livestock, etc. For, for aesthetic reasons uh, since antiquity. 
This particular elm in the photograph on the uh, right here, this is uh, one of my favorite trees. Uh, this is an American elm that I grew up looking out at my window. This is a very tall one as well, about 110 feet tall. I measured by a trigonometry, and there was a reason why it was tall. I mean, American elm gets pretty big anyway, but this one had been crowded by other American elms that died in a wave of Dutch elm disease in the 1970s. And this tree, unfortunately, now is dead as well. So this was at photographed around 1995. And here it is in 2011, decaying and falling apart and kind of sad. So I'm going to start off with kind of my personal connection to elms. And I'm very interested in trees, as probably a lot of you know, if you know, if you know me. And I would say this interest actually started with elms and me recognizing something was terribly, terribly wrong in the landscape I grew up in. And we'll look at that. So here's my mom buying the property that I grew up on in 1973. I'm not born for another five years, roughly, but this is how it looked when they purchased the property, my mom and my dad. And on this, this row here is almost all American elms, some quite big and old. The tree you saw in my photo a couple slides ago was this tree here, which survived the first wave of Dutch elm disease. Everything else here is an American elm, except for a little sugar maple there. There's a sugar maple we can barely see back there. And then the big red arrow is pointing at a rock elm, the first one I ever knew about. There's actually a big stump right there too, which I think Dutch elm disease had already shown up and was just getting started. But big elms everywhere. Big American elms in the background here, also on the left. And then we move on to July 1973. You see uh, a lot of uh, nice looking trees on the right. This is a fence row. Uh, but on the left, there's already a big dead tree, which is a dying Amer dying or dead American elm. In the background, some of the crowns look pretty light. Looks like they're dying as well. And of course, I'm born in 1978. I actually didn't even see a lot of these trees. I just saw stumps. So these trees I never saw. Most of these I never saw. Really just this tree and this tree were still there when I started forming memories. Here's September 73. There's that original tree. You can see how it was crowded, especially on this side. And then American Elm, American Elm, American Elm, American Elm, American Elm. American Elm is notable for having quite a variable set of growth forms. And Julia Rogers and other authors have actually talked about that and actually named some of the forms. And uh, this is not something we see every day anymore, right? In terms of a bunch of big American Elms, full-size American Elms, uh, side by side. So it's harder to gauge their personality these days because they're relatively isolated. This one here looks like it's already maybe dying a little thin on the crown. September 73, just looking in a slightly uh, further uh, eastern direction. Here's that uh, rock elm that I grew up knowing. There's a big stump there, which explains why the tree is very asymmetric to the left. It had no space to grow on the right. I never saw this tree. Big American elms, an old sugar maple. And in the background, not, not, not exactly a 4K photo here, but you can see it looks like some dead crowns there. Very likely American elm dying from Dutch elm disease back there. Here's 76 in September. So anything that's not got leaves is dead. So dead American elm, dead American elm, tons of dying and dead American elms in the background. There's a big sugar maple there, big basswood there. There's a, you can barely see my, my rock elm there that I grew up knowing. And that's my mom and my sister uh, hanging out with a, uh, what was going to become a house pretty soon. Here's uh, June 77. They're starting to fall apart a little bit as well. There's that big rock elm, which survived until the, that one's also dead, survived till the 90s. Dead, dead. Just tons of dead trees in the background. And then here's October 78. There's my original tree that survived until the 90s. You can see it's being forced to grow tall from fairly large trees on the left and the right. This one looks like it's already lost its twigs, right? Because it's been dead for a couple of years. I think this one's about to die. These ones I never saw. And here I am in a stroller, my sister and my mom in spring 1980. Here's my, here's, again, these are just photos that are from the family album. So thanks dad for taking random photos of usually people or farm equipment or things. I just got a few trees in the background here and there. Here's my American, my, sorry, my rock elm that survived until the nineties. Uh, and then dying and decaying, dead and decaying American elm, American elm, American elm, et cetera. And here's early 81, one of the most high res photos because it's black and white. This one's already dead. You can see the fineness of the twigs is falling apart. The big survivor in the last to the mid 90s. There's a big tree I grew up admiring the next uh, farm over as well. This one survived until fairly recently. I'm going to say about five or 10 years ago as well. And uh, yeah, just a, and you can see all the stumps. I grew up kind of knowing these stumps mostly because by the time I started forming memories, it was mostly just stumps actually. And spring 81, 
you know, this, this one's now gone. This one's falling apart. This one's gone. Just all sorts of dead American albums in the background here as well. So really just carnage. Right. And I grew up thinking that's not good. Something's wrong there. Maybe someone should do something about that. Anyway, um, November, uh, 2011, uh, this is actually right at the spot pretty much where that big rock elm was that I showed earlier at my house. This is a young tree that was a descendant of that tree. And you can see here, the growth form is very different from American elm for anyone who knows American elm. You see thick, quirky branches that are growing really sideways here. And I think you're never going to confuse that with an American elm. Here's another one that was alive in 2011, which is now dead as of 2020. And in fact, that original population of rock elm is all dead now. And luckily, though, I did collect a few seeds in 2015 before those died big seeds on the left shown here and here's a seedling growing in 2017 direct descendant of that original tree I showed from 73. So that's kind of my personal connection it's just um I grew up thinking this is kind of wrong someone should do something about that and uh luckily there's a lot of photos from the family album and it kind of helped me give me com some context. So over 50 years 73 was 50 years ago we went from being American elm dominant with rock elms and slippery elms here and there too to most of them gone, except the big ones anyway, and little ones you can find here and there. I'd like to see that, uh, you know, revert. That'd be that'd be kind of nice. So the, I guess if, if I'm biased, uh, that's my bias is a, a conservation ethic. Anyways, here's a new threat that maybe not all of you are aware of. Elm zigzag sawfly. This is something that the Ottawa Field Naturalist Club, with me as kind of in the lead on this, has been documenting the spread of this new invasive insect only known in North America since 2020. So this, this, this insect, you can see why it's called zigzag sawfly. Here it is with a feeding trace on an American elm leaf, very zigzaggy. For the first couple of years, I've been tracking this since 2021. Uh, we, were the first, we were the first group to show that this is in Ontario, first group to show it's in Vermont, first group to show it's in Toronto, et cetera. So we've been working pretty hard to find this. And for the first little bit, it's been just a curiosity. You can see this weird pattern we're not used to. And this year, about a, uh, two months ago in Cornwall, uh, we noticed this is not a curiosity anymore. So here's a, a mature American elm at Grace Creek Conservation Area in Cornwall. And this is not a Dutch elm disease killed tree. This is actually, you can see there's some color there. Those are the leaf petioles and veins still left after the, this is a smallish but mature smallish tree has been completely defoliated by this new pest. It's only been known in North America since 2020. And so uh, we were already tracking this still, but for, for the last uh, two months, I've been spending much of my time looking really hard for this again, because, uh, you know, we, we know it's spreading fast. We know it's got a big impact already at Cornwall, Ontario. Last year in Cornwall, trees did not look like this. And it wasn't just this one tree. Most of the trees at Grace Creek looked like this. Really kind of scary. So here's a map of the observations I have on iNaturalist of Elm Zigzag Sawfly. I went looking, especially we know it's spreading at least around Ottawa to the west, it seems, because it's harder to find to the west, easy to find to the east, easier to find to the south and the north as well. So sort of a northwest spread is what's apparent. And even last Wednesday, I took the day off work uh, and I went along the 41 corridor, not expecting to find anything. And to my great surprise, I even found it at Bon Echo Park. So we know this thing's spreading really rapidly. Here's a zoomed out Im image of showing uh, where I've seen it in uh, Eastern North America. So in Toronto, that's our first record in Toronto, June this year. And really kind of who knows where this thing is apart from it's spreading very rapidly. So we'll see about that. Anyways, I could give a whole lecture on that. Maybe I will someday if there's sufficient interest, but we'll move on. So challenges to the elms in general. So there's relatively little conservation attention paid to them. I'd say compared to, for example, I'd say deserved attention to chestnut, butternut, and black ash. Slippery and rock elms are particularly obscure, it seems to me, as well. Identification issues are widespread, including in some newer books as well. Some books just have incorrect photos for those species, and especially online. So, And often they're excluded from efforts to rehabilitate elms, I put in quotation marks, because they're kind of forgotten with respect to American elm. And I don't think that's correct. That should not be the case. Rock elm is, for example, widely reported now as a rare tree, but rarity is not historically documented. So rock elm was intensively targeted for cutting. We know this from factual records in the 19th and 20th centuries. That might help explain why it's less common today. And also, of course, it is susceptible to Dutch elm disease as well. Slippery elm hybridization with Siberian elm is another issue. Uh, the, the rock and American elm don't hybridize with exotics, really, that we know about, but slippery elm does. And especially hybridization with Siberian elm seems to be a potential threat. 
And I'm just going to show one example of kind of what I'm going to call ID chaos online. So Slip Realm, this is a little guide about Slip Realm. All the leaf photos are incorrect and they're actually American on. So that's not good. I, I just kind of in my head, I imagine, imagine a guide to birds and having uh, three photos of cardinals for Scarlet Tanager. To me, that's that's that bad. I mean, I don't know if it actually is that bad, but just it just seems ridiculous to me. So one of my goals for, for today is to just sort of show a lot of photos and how to tell these species apart. So the elms of North America, our region, we have three native species, American elm, slippery elm, and rock elm. The Southeast United States, there's actually three other species in the almost genus. There's a winged elm, cedar elm, and September elm. And there's also water elm, which is in the planera genus, which is closely related. And I include mentioning water elm because although it's not a true elm, it's very closely related. And for example, it is susceptible to Dutch elm disease. So it's worth mentioning as a close cousin, I think. And in Mexico, there's Mexican elm, which is the largest elm in the world, one of the largest trees in the world, very big, big, big tree, and Ishmael elm, which was only discovered in the 1990s on limestone uplands. Exotic elms found in North America, our region, we have Siberian elm, especially, it's a very weedy tree, quite common. We have witch elm, which is quite similar to Siberia, to uh, slippery elm, pardon me. Japanese elm, which has been brought in recently, recent decade or two, being planted pretty often because of probably Dutch elm disease resistance. And English elm I put with a question mark because I know it's been, it's been planted in the Northeast a fair bit, say Boston, much of New England. I don't see it much around Ontario, and I don't think it was either planted much or maybe they were mostly killed off by Dutch elm disease. At, at any rate, I don't see them regularly in Ontario. And Chinese elm in the southeast United States is an interesting species too. It has a very distinctive bark that's colorful. And another an alternative name for it is lace bark elm because of its interesting bark. Okay, so Siberian elm. We're gonna just gonna two or three some of the species here. Siberian elm characterized by very fine small leaves. I think you probably hear my cat's funny now. That's fun. Um, anyways, uh, Siberian elm, very small leaves and consequently very fine, thin twigs. Here's one growing in Carlington. And here's a close-up of the twigs on the right here. And very small buds as well. Black buds, dark bu buds that have kind of white lines on them. Here's a photo of the fruits on the left. Again, note the thinness, fineness of the twig, kind of ball-bearing looking dark buds here. And on the right, that's a typical size of the Siberian elm leaves with my hand for scale. They're teeny tiny leaves. This is a Siberian elm is a tree of kind of the interior of, uh, you know, East Asia, sort of, you know, the Mongolia, Siberia, kind of the, the dry region there. Japanese elm has been brought recently as intentional plantings around Ottawa and much of East North America. Dark, shiny leaves that look like this are pretty common. The tip of the buds are often kind of greenish looking with dark scales lower on the bud. Some of them have cork as well, and I've seen people post online that this is rock elm because there's cork, but actually a lot of elms grow cork on their twigs, rock elm, uh, so, uh, Japanese elm, English elm, a number of the southern elms in the United States also grow cork. So cork is not rare on elms. In our region, it's only rock elm as a native species that does it though. Witch elm, as I mentioned here, very similar to slippery elm. We'll talk about why later. This is a large one in Lynn, Ontario, full size, nice example of it. Uh, and then here's one at the Dominion Arboretum. Its scientific name is glabra, meaning smooth, which I believe it refers to the bark being relatively smooth and less furrowed, less deeply furrowed than most other elms. Uh, often it's uh, seen also as a weeping variety called Camperdown elm. So if you see weeping, kind of weeping mulberry type looking thing, that's an elm. It's almost definitely Camperdown elm, which is a selection of witch elm. And the, the twigs, twigs are very important to elm ID. The twigs of witch elm, dark black buds, uh, dark brown to black buds looks kind of just like that. Otherwise it's pretty similar looking to slippery elm, but slippery elm buds have uh, some differences we'll get into later. So the leaves also look very similar to slippery elm. The veins bifurcate towards the middle edge, as you see here. Slippery elm does the same thing. I would say the shape of witch elm is more boxy looking of the leaf than slippery elm, but otherwise the leaves are casually quite similar. Uh, witch elm has large leaves for an elm and slippery elm has even larger leaves than witch elm. So slippery elm has very large leaves often for an elm and witch elm leaves are pretty large as well. Okay, now elms have a, a rare combination of desirable traits which make them useful to humans and just useful generally. So they have medium to fast growth, medium to large ultimate size. 
So good shade trees, usefulness, ornamental, aesthetic, medicinal, edibility, wildlife, timber. So for example, they're noted since antiquity for use for wildlife fodder, for starvation foods for humans. They're not really known to be toxic and they're actually fairly nutritious for a tree, most of their parts. Slippery elm is of course famously well known for having medicinal bark, which is not common among the elms, but it's, it's, it's not only edible, but very useful for its bark. Uh, elms have a long life inherently. I have put an asterisk there, of course, because of Dutch elm disease. Uh, they're adaptable on many kind of habitats. They're easy to grow from seed and to transplant. They're hardy to many conditions and they have a strong wood. Generally, rock elm has famously strong wood. And I, something I'm gonna, I should have probably added here is that they actually have very rot resistant wood with water as well. So they're good for aqueducts, uh, underwater use, like the pilings and docks and things like that. And I noticed that when I was a kid, actually, a lot of the ponds at my property were full of elm wood from that Dutch elm disease wave. And the wood had barely rotted in 10 or 15 years or 20 years even from when the trees had died. So I'd call them heirloom trees, really good trees to plant. And except for this, this maybe this asterisk of Dutch elm disease, which maybe we can work on and do better on. Our native elms are not close related, and I can't emphasize that enough, right? So we have three species. They're actually in different sections, all three of them. So American elm is in subgenus, I'm probably going to say this wrong, but Oreotalia, I'm going to say, section of Blepharocarpus. And the only close relative in the elms it has is Russian elm, or sometimes called fluttering elm, almost lavis, which is a European species that goes to Russia as well. And they, they're close related, and the other elms are not close related. So for example, slippery elm, is in the subgenus Almus section Almus, which is a clue that that's a common type in Europe. So when, when Linnaeus and, and friends were making up the taxonomy of elms, subgenus Almus, which means elm, section Almus, which means elm, these are probably the elms that the Europeans knew the best. And sure enough, it's closely related to witch elm, somewhat closely related to many Eurasian species as well in different sections of the subgenus Almus, such as Siberian elm and Japanese elm. And I've already noted how it actually hybridizes easily with Siberian elm. I don't know if it hybridizes much with Japanese elm, and I'm sure we're going to find out because Japanese elm is being planted a lot in recent years. Rock elm is of a, I'm going to call the North American section, essentially, right? There's actually one Asian species, which we're not considering because it's not planted here, but it's in subgenus Oreotelia, sort of like, like American elm. It actually does look more like American elm than slippery elm. Its section is in Catotalia, and its close relatives are the other American elms besides the American elm. So meaning not almost Americana, but winged cedar, September elm of the Southeast United States, and the Mexican elms, Mexican elm itself, and Ishmael elm. So I'd say American elm and rock elm look sort of similar in some ways. I could see how they could be confused. Slippery elm, I would say, should never be confused. It looks rather different. This I've, I've mentioned this to some people online who sometimes don't even believe me when I say that. But an, an analogy I would make would be that slippery elm and uh, American elm they're different. They're as different as say red maple and sugar maple. If you can tell red maple from sugar maple, you can tell American elm from slippery elm because they're just not closely related. They're very different looking. And rock elm and American elm are a little more subtle, but we'll get into some of those subtleties as we as we talk. Okay, American elm we're going to consider first very widely distributed and adaptable species. Essentially, it's everywhere from Nova Scotia to Saskatchewan to southern Texas to almost tropical Florida, everywhere. And of course, you know, this map is a little ambitious in the sense as you get, well, it actually shows it here. As you get to the plains, it, you maybe only find it along some of the river valleys and things. But American elm is very generalist, very weedy in terms of propagating itself. It propagates itself at a young age and is very good at propagating itself. So I'd say it's still pretty common, actually, just not usually as big trees. Uh, it's I'd call it the ultimate shade tree. Of course, uh, writers before Dutch elm disease noted how it was basically the preferred shade tree throughout Eastern North America, <laughs> everywhere pretty much, right? Especially the Northern part of Eastern North America, like New England. Here's one in the Glebe near Lansdowne Park. Here's one on Clemo Avenue, also in the Glebe. These are say full size American elms that are still alive today, I believe they were recently. Here's a very large American elm at the Medcalf Fairgrounds. I actually went to school in Medcalf and I used to look at this tree out my window in the 1990s and I'm very happy to report it's still alive. You can see it's a pretty big tree. Here's my mom who uh, seems to pose beside a lot of trees from the 70s till now. Uh, this is a large tree, right? <laughs> it's impressive. Uh, elms can often, if you get close to them, you can kind of be impressed by the scale of them. Um, and you can see the large buttressing here. American elm in particular, 
uh, just like Mexican elm, actually, in, in Mexico, uh, does it even more. Very, very large buttresses quite frequently. That, that's a common thing. Here's a large one in downtown Elmer, Quebec, just across the Ottawa River. You know, again, a large, imposing, impressive tree, five feet diameter. There's my mom posing beside it again. Something interesting here, too, this is almost entirely surrounded by asphalt. And the tree is happy and healthy and doing fine. So elms are very hardy in the urban setting. Here's an American elm near Carlsbad Springs. This is another five foot diameter tree, uh, fairly short stocky tree. Again, we noted earlier how they have quite a variation in growth form inherently. This tree was actually in the bullseye of that derecho, May 2022, right in the line of strongest winds, which were equivalent to an F1 or F2 tornado. And this looks like, okay, it got damaged and some leaves are gone. Most of the trees that are nearby are much more damaged or completely flattened compared to this American elm. I'd say it held up very well. And I was happy to see when I went by again recently, it's still standing as of a few months ago. I think it's going to survive, which is great. Here I am standing beside an American elm in a forest. I wouldn't call an American elm, Amer American elm really a very, you know, forest typical tree. It's often in forests and say swampy woods or along ravines with streams and things like that. But it's intermediate in tolerance and not overly competitive with say sugar maple and beech and the super tolerant trees. So as a forest goes through succession and gets older, American elm is often restricted to sort of niche habitats. A comparison I might make is with white pine. White pine is also not very shade tolerant, but like American elm, they both grow really fast and they're kind of generalist in their habitat requirements. So if they can get uh, going in a forest gap, pretty much nothing will catch them once they're establishing themselves. And this is, yeah, a nice mature one in the Dutch elm disease age near Kingston in a sugar bush, essentially. So somehow it probably found a gap and got taller than the sugar maples when it found some light. Here, uh, so again, I mentioned earlier how the twigs are very important. This is a typical American elm twig, a pressed chestnut uh, brown buds. A pressed means, of course, buds that are close to the twig and the, 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 the terminal bud, or it's actually a false terminal bud, but the, the end bud is often strongly kinked, strongly tilted to one side, right? T towards the side where the last bud was. That's an American elm thing. So if you're, if you think you have an American elm, look for twig features like that and it should match. Here's the flowers in spring as well. And the leaves, uh, they're going to match probably what you what you know as, a, as elm leaves, right? So they look kind of like saw blade for the teeth. They have large teeth. Uh, they don't tend to have forking veins near, there's one forking vein there, but not many forking veins near the edges. See here, there's no forking veins. Here, there's maybe one in the background there. None there, none there. So it's not really forking much at the edge, especially the middle edge of the leaf. And here's the seeds. They have what looks like almost like an earwig's pinchers at the bottom of the seed. That's pretty distinctive, I'd say, for at least the, are the elms in our region. Here's a photo showing American elm typical leaves in the center, juvenile leaves on the right, and slippery elm leaves on the left. I would say those all look pretty different. Uh, the two that are directly comparable are the American and the slippery. So for example, you see the American has larger teeth and you see the forking veins a little bit on the slippery elm here on the left. I'd say slippery elm leaves are thicker, kind of more ghost looking as well, less shiny. Slippery elm leaves are usually large. I actually picked this branch off a slippery elm because it had small leaves. It was growing kind of at the side of the tree. All the rest of the leaves on the tree were much larger than these ones. I just wanted to get a comparable shot. Now, this juvenile is basically first couple years of growth for American elm. And these trees are often mistaken for slippery elm because they often have very rough hairs on the leaves. And slippery elm is famous for having sandpaper leaves. So something else to watch out for, for young American elms and they're growing vigorously, the leaves can be kind of distorted looking, but notice they're not really forking at the edges. And the buds, you're not going to see as well, but they are brown. Slippery elm buds are not brown. We'll get into that later. So here's slippery elm and rock elm. I'm going to spend the rest of the talk mostly talking about them. This is a rock elm here. This is a textbook, beautiful slippery elm here on the right. So rock elm and slippery elm both like limestone. Uh, elms generally like limestone. Rock and slippery are particularly amenable to it. American elm does better on limestone than, say, uh, you know, acidic environments. But Anyways, rock elm is almost limestone obligate in some cases, or like limestone derived clays. Slippery elm you find much more easily on limestone as well, or limestone derived clays. So slippery elm, bark, uh, kind of a light gray typically, upright branching, the branches, they kind of always upright and ascend, kind of 45 degrees 
everywhere you look. That's very typical slippery elm, not weeping like an American elm in any really way. Rock elm is often a very rugged tree. Lower branches often are pendulous and long. And you can see, maybe, maybe not, because this is zoomed out, the, the branches have thick and cork here and there. We'll see a lot more as we go here. So a slippery elm, I'd say, is also widely distributed and adaptable, but less so than American elm. And likes limestone, likes, uh, yeah, likes neutral to higher pH kind of clays and things like that. Notice it's absent from the Adirondacks. It's a smaller range, but still quite an extensive range. It's still considered a pretty common tree. And um, it's uh, often in our region found with sugar maple. Anyway, so here's some old slippery elms to show you how the growth form, I would say, looks very different from American elm. This is a probably the largest slippery elm I've ever seen. And unfortunately, this tree did die and was cut down in the last couple of years. This is behind a church on Maitland Avenue in Ottawa. I think it's an original forest tree that the suburbs basically got built up to. This tree is probably at least 200 years old, just based on how big it was and kind of just the thick wood up high. The growth form as well. I'd say the growth form is slippery elm typical, but it looks almost like an oak or something. Very spreading, large branches without that vase-like umbrella form of American elm. Here's a large tree at Mooney's Bay. This was actually the tree that I showed in the three for my title slide. This is it during the kind of dormant, or I guess this is flowering season. You can see again, coarse branching, uh, you know, not really fine branching and very different growth form from American elm, I would say. It looks more like maybe basswood or something. And here's the bark, pretty typical as well. The bark, uh, the ridges tend to intersect less the ridges tend to intersect less than other elms so you don't really get a crisscross pattern more of a shaggy pattern similar maybe to white oak in some cases anyways that's that's a large slippery on mooney's bay you can see today it's doing well and it's alive this tree is probably at least 100 to 150 years old looks pretty old to me here's one that i know is 100 years old or was 100 years old because it died from dutch elm disease and was cut down this is at copeland park in Nepean, and much smaller than the last two i showed and behind it's a basswood. This is again, a typical early maturity growth form, I'd say for slippery elm. This looks a bit like some of the, uh, the cartoons you see in some of the uh, tree books, uh, say Native Trees of Canada, the cartoon work looks a bit like that, I'd say. Here's a large one at Elmer, Quebec as well. This one has also died and has been cut down. Um, and again, very non-American elm growth form, rather spreading and ascending for the growth form, I would say. Here's a early maturity one along Mitchell and uh, Mitchell Owens Road. This one's doing fine. I wanted to know here, see how trees behind it are actually leafing out? Slippery elm also leafs out very late regularly. So you, don't, don't, don't necessarily think that your tree has died if you have one and it's uh, almost end of May and the buds are just swelling still because they just do that. And often the seeds, uh, the flowers and seeds come out first. The seeds are green. It seems like it takes advantage of photosynthesis through the green seeds before it sends out its leaves. Maybe that's an ad adaptation to avoiding frost damage in the spring. I don't know. But slippery elms often leaf out very late. Here's a early mature tree uh, near Gananoque. Again, you know, ascending branches. Again, that typical bark that's, let's say, a distinctive light gray with less intersecting ridges than the other elms. Again, here's a young tree, both in spring and uh, late spring. And you see, again, just the ascending branches. Right? This tree is probably only about 15 feet tall, but notice all the branches are pointing essentially up. That's pretty typical of young slippery elm. Here's a very nice one at Jessup's Falls Conservation Area. This is like a full size one beside white pine and red oak that are also quite large. This tree is about two and a half feet diameter. So I don't know if it comes across in the photos how big it is. It's rather large. And you can see here, looking up at a zoom photo of the leaves, you see again those splitting uh, veins on the edges of the, of the leaves. Typical of slippery elm. And these leaves are rather large. For the size of the leaves, things sort of like basswood for size. The twigs, as I've been mentioning, are very important for elm identification. Slippery elm has black scales or like very dark to black scales with white lines separating the scales and red hairs on the tips of the buds, especially the flower buds here are like red and really hairy. And uh, even like the, the vegetative buds, they might have less hairs and the hairs can actually get weathered off by say early spring. But usually red hairs are pretty easy to see on slippery elm buds. Even in, in shaded conditions where usually you see a few, you might need a hand lens for that because often they're less developed in say the understory. 
Here's a, a slipper gum that's flowering. So the male flowers on the left are their uh, black, uh, you know, pollen uh, producing parts here. And here's the pollen receptors. The, the flowers, bo both sexes occur on the same tree. Often the trees look rather reddish as the flowers emerge because the pollen receptors are rather red and often conspicuous from a distance uh, in maybe a few days as slipper gum is flowering. And here's the fruits. They lack that uh, earwig like pincher at the tip and they're they're relatively hairless in fact they might be literally hairless right they're they're rather hairless and this looks more like siberian elm fruit japanese elm fruit witch elm fruit which of course the tree is much closer related to Slippery elm was characterized by large leaves and coarse branching here's one that was planted at a park in Embrun, and just the leaves are I'd say pretty large. <laughs> you can see my hand for comparison here. Often the leaves are folded in kind of half as well, especially on drier sites. That's that's a thing that we've uh, we've observed, and I, I think some other authors have talked about. Here you can see the forking at the edge of the leaf, uh, uh, at the margin of the leaf, and relatively small teeth as well. And just two more typical examples of slippery elm leaves here. And again, these leaves are rather large for an elm, like much larger than a typical American elm leaf in both cases here. Again, note, note the forking veins at the edges. So again, I mentioned that the leaves often fold. One of the kind of comments we have casually is that they, they, they remind us of tacos. They look almost like a hard shell taco sometimes. And again, notice the ascending branchlets here. Slip realm, even on a spreading branch, has lots of ascending branches going up from that spreading branch. You can often spot slip realm from a kilometer away kind of thing because it just has a very distinctive ascending growth form. And again, from far away, when the leaves are on, the leaves tend to hang tip down. And to me, this might be like reaching at, you know, grasping at straws here, but to me, it kind of looks like shark's teeth almost from a great distance. It looks almost like the edge of the shark's mouth, all these big leaves pointing down. It definitely has like a jagged, icicle kind of look compared to the other elms. Certainly. And again, notice the ascending branches everywhere. Okay, here's the slippery elm in the, the shade of an understory. Slippery elm is pretty common in the understory of sugar bushes, I'm going to say especially. And often they're low along the ground. They're, they're, they persist in shade. And the tips of the buds here do have red hairs on them, but it's much muted when the trees are in the shade. Again, note the forking veins. Okay, I mentioned earlier how Siberian elm hybridizes with slippery elm, and Siberian elm has teeny tiny leaves, and the buds are very different, etc. So the the first generation of hybrids that are crossed are very obvious because it has traits of two very different looking species. So here's just a hybrid that I noticed in the city of Ottawa with red hairs at the tips of the buds, but just all the features are kind of wrong. The leaves are too small, they're too narrow, the buds are too round, they look kind of like ball bearings still like uh, Siberian elm, the trees changing color late as some Siberian elms do. It just looks completely wrong. And uh, yeah, so hybridization is an issue for slippery elm in addition to Dutch elm disease. Okay, rock elm is the last tree we're gonna look at in depth. And this is one that's probably kind of my uh, sentimental favorite just because I find them really interesting and uh, not widely uh, talked about, I guess, historically. So, okay, this is a species that's adapted to limestone uplands, heavy clays, and I'm gonna call it pretty shade tolerant. My experience is that it, persists very well in sugar bush and other kind of mature climax forests. So here's the map from uh, Little Wikipedia, extends into our region, and you know basically uh, southern Great Lakes, U.S. Midwest, and down into Tennessee, and then scattered uh, New England and things like that too. Anyways, here's that here's the tree that I showed on the, the title slide. Typical textbook appearance. They're often narrower than American elm, but I wouldn't call them a narrow species. They're a very rugged looking tree. Often you have uh, pendulous branches near the bottom. And often you have kind of bumps on the trunk where old branches were. They tend to grow burls essentially where old branches have been either self pruned or literally pruned by say an arborist. They often grow kind of <laughs> balls and things, uh, wooden balls where those uh, branches either were or sometimes still are. This is the largest known living rock elm in the world, as far as I can tell. This is in Merrickville, Ontario. It's beside a mansion called the Percival House, and this tree is very old. So I've seen old photos of this mansion shortly after it was constructed, and that tree is already there with branches you can recognize today. But the tree is, of course, thinner and probably not as tall, but it's already a pretty large tree. So I'm going to propose that this tree likely descends from the original forest and it was retained as the town was built up. So this tree is about 92 feet tall by three and a half feet diameter. It's a full-size rock elm. Here it is in winter, surviving the December 2013 ice storm very well, which impacted 
parts of South, southeastern Ontario and especially Toronto was all over the, the, the news in uh, 2013, as I recall. Uh, here's a, a very large tree as well in Hardington. Uh, this is near Kingston, uh, being trimmed back by utilities here. Notice another nice old house by it. Just um, a rugged, lovely shade tree. Rock Elm, the very large in that Voyager Provincial Park. Uh, this is probably the largest stem I've seen on public property. This is about a little over three feet diameter, a little, a little over a meter diameter. So it's, it's, a, it's a nice full-size rock elm as well. Uh, here's one at Carleton University that died recently. I think around 2020, it uh, got Dutch Lung disease and died. Again, this tree, I believe, it's not, I wouldn't call it very old per se, but it was, I think, there when Carleton University was built. There's also a lot of maturing bur oaks in the area and it's just likely was retained when the buildings were built notice how it's not a narrow tree a lot of books will say that rock elms are narrow and i'm going to say that that's only part of the story at best um here's one in nepean again a retained tree this is a 1960 roughly constructed neighborhood this is the largest tree in the neighborhood it's surrounded by uh nori maple and things kind of depressing anyways this is the last surviving rock elm in this neighborhood uh there was one right across the road that died about five years ago here's one of the nicest ones in ottawa this is right by the bronson bridge along queen elizabeth drive that's the bronson bridge right behind it this is a pretty large tree it's probably about 75 feet high or so the lower branches have been trimmed off of it so it's losing kind of its character a little bit Here's some that are not trimmed. Uh, this is Verona, Ontario, near Kingston. See the lower re retention of, of oops, lower retention of branches here. Uh, branches are very rugged looking on both these trees. Also, this one that's that was in a conservation area at Verona. These are typical mature rock elms and uh, very rugged in the form of a, in, in the style of Baroque, I'd say. So here's one that's young and indeed narrow and kind of uh, with apical dominance here on the left. Here's an older one in a limestone plain near Kingston on the right. Both are typical. This one is showing kind of the form that a timber uh, baron would love because Rockham, of course, has extraordinarily valuable timber and uh, very hard. What it, it wouldn't be a large exaggeration, maybe not even an exaggeration at all, to say that it's the most valuable hardwood tree historically in eastern North America. It's right up there with the hickories, and often it gets bigger than hickories, at least before Dutch on disease. So very, very, very valuable tree. <laughs> Here's a young one with a bushy kind of beach-like growth form, again, showing they're not really characterized by being overly narrow. Um, I would say that looks nothing like American elm. Here's a, here's a few near uh, Flower Station, and here's another one near Chesterville. The lower branches are often quirky, especially in open conditions, so thick cork, sort of like bur oak, can often grow on them. But that is not required to be present, and a lot of rock elms do not show that tree. So you sometimes see them in colonies as well. Uh, here's three rock elms. I would say that this one on the right and this one are probably not directly related. They might be kind of, you know, by seed or something, but they're pretty far apart from each other. But this one on the left and this one in the middle, this looks suspiciously like a root sucker. So rock elm does have the ability to vegetatively reproduce itself by sending up sprouts like a poplar. And uh, it does that a bit, not all the time, but... Uh, it, it, that's one of its methods for reproducing itself. Here's three mature ones uh, near Carlton Place. Again, I'd say they're probably too far apart to be likely vegetatively related, but it shows some different growth forms and appearances of rock elm. Again, notice the pendulous branches that are retained. Here's a kind of striking example at a new suburban park in Canada. This tree by some miracle was retained and I'm really happy to see that it was because often mature trees are not retained with new construction. And you can see here the typical twigs of rock elm in the foreground differentiating it from say bur oak, which is another rugged tree. Uh, here's a rock elm in the forest at Voyager Provincial Park a growing with hemlock and sugar maple. Again, rock elm is rather shade tolerant, persists under deep shade, under sugar maple, sometimes even with hemlock and things like that. And this is a becoming a full-size tree. And another thing to note is the nice autumn color. So if you like yellow, yellows are often kind of black because often they're kind of brown and yellow. Rock elm often is a bright yellow, sort of like a hickory. So again, I would say it's a reasonably decent autumn color tree, uh, especially for an elm. 
Here's the Merrickville largest tree known, uh, the base of it in, uh, in Merrickville here. And you see the bark is actually falling off from a process called balding. Very old trees, often the thick bark just falls away. And here's a mid-maturity rock elm in Verona. And you can see large branches that are now dead, still hanging down because they also rot slowly. So this tree is just rugged perfection, in my opinion. Okay, rock elm, some of some more evidence of the shade tolerance. Most of the trees I find today are actually in sugar bushes. So he, these smaller trees here are under black and sugar maple near Cornwall on clay, and they're doing very well, thank you. They're actually dominating the rest of the understory, suppressing sugar maple seedlings. And here's a close-up of the leaves. The leaves have uh, very densely packed veins, like lots of veins per inch, you might say. And the leaves are relatively narrow and symmetric looking compared to many other elms. So here's another understory elm where the overstory has lost its leaves in uh, autumn and this plant hadn't lost its leaves yet. Again, shade tolerant, looking happy and bushy in the understory. You can see some thickened cork is growing on this twig, whereas it's not on the previous section of the twig. On the, in the understory, this corky branch thing is often more or less non-existent because why would they waste energy growing thick bark where they're barely surviving perhaps in deep shade. Again, pointy, uh, divergent. So the buds are not stuck to the twig like American elm. They're kind of pointing away from the twig. They're pointier and they're often yellow tipped, rather different from American elm with some practice anyway. Rock elm, further evidence of the rather high uh, shade tolerance. This is a tree that was killed by Dutch elm disease at Reveler Conservation Area in a sugar bush kind of woodlot. This tree has over 250 annual rings and was only a little over a foot diameter. So if you look at these rings, there's you're not gonna see it on this image, but if, if you look at this image closely, there's very close spaced rings in periods where then there was some release from suppression and then further suppression, very close rings again. And then eventually the tree achieved dominance and became a tree. But this tree survived for a century or more and was only a few inches diameter. And that seems pretty typical of rock elm. I'm just gonna mention, this is a cross section. You can see the bark here too. Uh, a lot of people tell me that they can't tell slippery elm without cutting the bark and I don't like uh, invasive or somewhat destructive methods. So one difference between rock elm, slippery elm, and American elm. Rock elm and American elm, the bark cross section has white quirky lines, and slippery elm, the cross section of the bark does not have those white lines. But I would say, I'm hoping I'm showing enough appearances of the trees tonight where anyone who used to re rely on the practice of cutting elm bark to see if there's lines in the cross section doesn't have to do that anymore because slippery elm just looks so different anyway. Couple more photos of rock on here. So here's again a uh, very rugged looking tree in the background and some of its twigs in the foreground. Yeah, the buds are often this kind of light reddish brown, often with yellowish tips, as you see on this twig on the right. So here you've got flower buds here, 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 and two vegetative buds here. But notice the kind of yellowish tips there. Again, here's the flowers in spring. This is a mature rock elm that has no thickened cork at all on its branchlets, but it's still a rock elm, doesn't really have to have cork. And the flowers are in racemes or like a chain. So the original name for rock elm was actually almost meaning elm, racemosa, referring to the flowers. And it was changed to Tomasi because uh, there, I think there was another elm that had already been called racemosa, at least at one point. So it was actually switched to honor uh, David Thomas, I think it was, who first recognized rock elm as a different species. One of, one of the last slides here. So rock elm, like all the elms, is considered edible, can be eaten by animals or even people to some degree. Rock elm, I'm going to say, is good. So here is a little article from William Doré, botanist at Canada Department of Agriculture. This is written in the 60s, I think, just saying, have you ever tried eating the seeds? They're pretty good and they don't kill you. They're actually pretty nutritious, apparently. And the seeds are much larger than uh, slippery elm or rock elm. They're about the kernel inside this green container, I'm going to call it, is about the size of a sunflower seed and tastes really good. It's sort of like a garlicky, oniony, nutty flavor, and it seems healthy. And the animals go nuts for this. It's actually really hard to collect rock elm seeds because often by the times they're ripened, sort of like service berries, right? You try to maybe have a service berry crop. By the time you get to them, some flock of animals went through and they're all gone. So these ripen in late spring when actually it's like a starvation time after the winter for a lot of animals. I would say rock elm is very useful as a wildlife food tree as well. 
even just for its fruit crop in the spring. The fruit ripen around May 24th to June 1st or thereabouts. So um, around the same time as silver maple, but they seem much uh, better tasting than silver maple. Here's just a couple more photos of the leaves. Look how closely spaced those veins are. You can see the yellow tips on the buds. I'd say this looks rather different from American elm. This is this is an open grown tree. This is a shade uh, suppressed tree. The, see the leaf bases are also symmetric at the leaf base. A lot of sources say that all elms have asymmetric leaf bases. And you can see rock elm didn't read that report because they are not asymmetric. And again, see the yellow tip on this bud here. Uh, and again, narrow leaves on an open uh, branch on a tree with closely spaced veins. Another autumn color thing, which I find interesting, is often the leaves turn yellow at the edge first. See how it's yellow at the edge on all these leaves? That can look rather attractive, at least to me, from a distance as the, the fall season just begins. Again, I find rock elm, if you like rugged trees, in it, which I do, like pitch pine and bur oak as well, very attractive in some ornamental ways. So my recommendations, uh, thanks for coming tonight, is to basically just understand the biology and history of elms so we can think about conservation in a serious way. Appreciate their usefulness and aesthetics of them if one is uh, attracted to the way they look and it has maybe uses for them, such as the wood or edible qualities. And I'd recommend restore, don't abandon them. So it seems like there's a trend to maybe just introduce Asian elms now, which are from the land of Dutch elm disease, which are resistant to Dutch elm disease to kind of, I guess, replace our native species. And as a conservationist, that just doesn't sit very well to me. So I have no problem with introducing, you know, trees to new locations to some degree. But if you're going to do full sale replacement, I don't buy into that at all. Because where does it stop? Right? We're losing our ashes. We're losing our beach. We're losing hemlock, possibly with the uh, the moving north of HWA. Do we just replace everything? That seems like a very bankrupt policy to me. Uh, so thanks for your time. I'm just gonna show one more weird thing. Uh, this is an elm seedling and notice it's turning red and yellow, but the red came first in autumn. I've never seen that before. This I believe is a hybrid uh, of uh, Siberian elm with slippery. I picked it off a slippery tree in the city, probably pollen from a Siberian elm as the father. And also notice that elm seedlings are opposite leave in their first year. Uh, if you, I didn't talk about this tonight, but elms, of course, are, are characterized by having alternate leaves. But again, in their first year, they're not alternate, they're opposite. So in the next year, this would switch to alternate growth, which I find kind of interesting. I'll stop it there. We're just before eight. And if there's any time and interesting questions, I'll be happy to take them as well. Thank you. That was excellent. Thank you so much, Owen. Um, if anybody else feels the same way that I do, I definitely want to jump out there right now and go look for elm trees. Um, yeah, sounds like a lot of fun that you have doing that. Um, so we'll just take a couple of minutes um, just as people have questions to put into the Q&A or the chat that's now enabled for participants. Um, yeah, we have a we have a little gift for you, Owen, um, as a as a, a token of appreciation for you putting together this wonderful presentation and spending some time with us tonight. And um, we have some OWA swag coming to you, um, an insulated mug, so you can you can look forward to that. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, and I was just so curious when you were going through your talk with all those old photos, photos from your childhood. Um, and your mom appeared in a lot of them. Um, was your dad always behind the camera? Or did he get in front of the camera ever? Was he ever in any of the pictures? Yeah, so one should always give uh, credit where credit is due. He was the photographer, so I can thank him for taking all of those photos from the uh, 70s. Uh, I, I, would, I would not have any evidence of what really happened there except for stumps, which I, I, re, I, re, I remember those stumps starting at around, I don't know, 1982 or so, right? Because you're, you're just sort of at forming your first memories. But luckily, he was taking photos already for close to 10 years of the property. And thanks to him for taking all those photos. And my mom was just uh, sort of in those photos a lot. And my mom has been, uh, shout out to her, has been an excellent resource going on many trips uh, to the present day looking for elms as well. I probably got the tree lover gene from her is my guess. <laughs> we all have to get it from somewhere. Yep. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. It must have been a family a family involved um, experience looking through all those photos together. Absolutely. It was really great for me to get those photos because I, uh, yeah, I just, I, I remember they existed at some point. So about five or 10 years ago, I made sure I got some of them and I digitized them so I could use them in talks like today. Super, super. 
All right, well, we've got a few questions coming in. Um, just so everyone knows, we're gonna take a couple extra minutes. Um, if anybody has to go, um, the recording will be available if you're not able to stay, but um, Owen has kindly offered to stay on to, to answer some questions for us. Um, so I'll jump right in here. Um, I'll jump right in here with a question from Sarah. Um, she said, can you clarify if it is only mature American elm trees that are killed by DED, so Dutch elm disease? We have four American elms on our property, all fairly small. Can we do anything to protect them? So a couple questions in there. Yeah, that's a great, great set of questions, and I'll try to address all the points there. So uh, American elms are probably not a lot more susceptible than I'm going to call so-called juvenile elms, like elms that are getting uh, bark thick enough to support bark beetles. So of course, I would have liked to have talked for probably 12 hours here to give a lot of more details. But so Dutch elm disease is spread by bark beetles. And when, when American elms are really small, uh, basically there's no vector to spread the disease because the bark is too thin and the bark beetles uh, seem to just avoid them, right? Because there's no bark to burrow into. But as the elms get bigger and the bark gets a little thicker, this is maybe year 10, 20, things like that. They, they become susceptible from then on. So um, they can they can die uh, from rather small sizes and young ages. And I would actually argue that large trees that are still alive today, 50 plus years after the landscape has just been completely ravaged by Dutch elm disease, Either they're extraordinarily lucky, like winning the Powerball lottery kind of lucky, like astronomically lucky, or they probably have, you know, to some degree, maybe a little resistance or some kind of trait that makes them less likely to die from Dutch elm disease than the ones that say died in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and the early 21st century. So I'm hoping, uh, and again, the Elm Recovery Project run out of Guelph, uh, for example, is looking to find large surviving American elms under the theory, which seems to have some plausibility to it, that large surviving American elms might be somewhat resistant or uh, have some traits that make them lucky besides just pure luck, right? <laughs> they, they survive for some reason probably to, to today. Now, in terms of protecting the trees, uh, if you have a favorite American elm or uh, several, you can inject um, you know, uh, chemicals into the tree. Sometimes you see this actually on plant plantations of American elms, like the elm malls, like the lined streets, like say Island Park Drive, uh, say the NRC campus on Montreal Road, things like this, where uh, you know fungicide and or insecticide, probably insecticide mostly, being injected into the trees to probably keep away the vectors like the bark beetles and things like that. So there are some steps that can be taken to protect a few trees here and they're like specimen trees, but they're not 100% effective and they're pretty expensive. So my suggestion would be for like society anyway, on a wider scale, we should probably think about doing better research on how does one seriously deal with this. <laughs> I'll give some examples. So one example is in, in Europe, the Russian elm, which is very similar to American elm, is considered a little less Dutch elm disease prone than some of the other elms. And I remember reading that it's not considered necessarily inherently that resistant, but there is some subtle reasons why the vectors don't spread it as well uh, from tree to tree. So we we can probably do a lot better in terms of research and development and for, for restoration of elms and our other native trees that have declined as well. Hopefully we that have a helped answer. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, related to Dutch elm disease, we have a couple questions in the Q&A about that. Um, one of the upvoted questions uh, was just re regarding the status of Dutch elm disease. Um, would you say things are getting worse, getting better? It sounds like there's a lot of research going on. Is there anything you could touch on there, Owen? Yeah, so I, I can definitely talk a lot about that. But um, I would say something interesting that, to me anyway, I would say the the danger of it has probably been fairly stable since the 70s, meaning it's it's been virulent for 50 years, been killing a lot of elms for 50 years, but the effects on the three species, I think, is somewhat different. So American elm, as I mentioned earlier, very weedy and very generalist in terms of its habitat requirements. So the population of American elm seems fairly stable, especially in kind of farmland country, where often it's still the dominant tree. It's just large trees are often few and far between, because they don't tend to live as long for the most part. 
I would say the effects on rock and slippery elm, which have a different life history, they're they're less weedy, they're more specialists in their needs, especially rock elm, uh, and uh, they they don't establish themselves with the same kind of vigor uh, in kind of you know disturbed habitats. Their populations, especially rock elm, seems to be declining, 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 declining. And if one you know plots a trend like that, eventually you hit maybe a local extirpation or extinction, right? So I think, um, interestingly, American elm was declared endangered by the IUCN fairly recently. And rock elm, for example, uh, last time I looked, had deficient data, which to me actually is a bit telling. If you can't find rock elms to build data, to have a database very easily, that maybe suggests to you that they're already not doing so well for population, especially mature trees. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, there's no historical records indicating that they were a rare tree. And in fact, in sugar bushes and other shade tolerant climax forests, I easily find rock elms still with the caveat being they're young suppressed trees that are still there, but they're not big enough to have thick bark and they're not making fruit. And if they become dominant in the stand, they may get killed by Dutch elm disease fairly quickly, right? So the, I think rock elm has been under assessed in terms of probably how endangered it actually is, just my opinion here. And I would like to see it taken more seriously, has some actual data. I can tell you I am collecting data on rock elm. Uh, when I find them, I record where they are. And if they're dying or dead, I note that. But the idea being over maybe 10 or 20 years to show the rate of decline, which again, I think the rate is fairly steady, but it's still a decline, especially for rock elm and somewhat for slippery elm. Mm. Um, just one final question on the topic of Dutch elm disease. Um, Darren says, Darren's asked if there's a way to know what has killed elm, an elm tree, specifically that he has several dying trees, uh, but he doesn't know what to look for with regards to Dutch elm disease. Are there any um, clear signs, Owen, that someone could look for? Yes. So there are, there are other fatal issues of elms. Uh, another typical one being uh, elm uh, yellows um, or uh, you know, so so th th there's different symptoms. So, I mean, to be conclusive, you'd want to collect, say, a, you know, a sample of the tree, that sort of thing. Right. But Dutch elm disease is pretty obvious in terms of its uh, in terms of being likely. So Dutch elm disease tends to kill uh, American elms. Often like one branch will get infected and then that branch withers because Dutch elm disease, the mechanism of killing the tree is by plugging the wood. Like, so the water can't flow from the roots to the, say the branch where the leaves want the water. So there's a withering appearance, often patchy on trees as it starts for uh, Dutch elm disease. So if you see a branch turn, you know, uh, black, <laughs> the leaves just curl up and die suddenly. And then next year, maybe more branches turn black and die. Uh, the leaves, the, the leaf, they leaf out in spring, but then they wither by midsummer, late summer. That's telltale Dutch elm disease. And that is the most common killer by far, in my experience, in eastern Ontario, anyway. Mm. Um, one more question about Dutch elm disease. Um, Robin has asked what elm species and or varieties are being sold in nurseries? Um, are they being advertised as Dutch elm disease resistant? Uh, would they be resistant in, in the long term? Yeah, so the, what I'm seeing being offered in nurseries that are not specialist is now it's often moved on to uh, Japanese elm, almost japonica, sometimes classified as Davidiana, David's elm, which is a mainland Asian species. And I would just say that, uh, yeah, so what I'm seeing is the trend is, is towards replacement of our native species, which is concerning to me. There is some offering of American elm resistant varieties. American elm is known to have difficulty in terms of hybridization because it has few close relatives. Again, the only close relative is Russian elm. And it also, many American elms are also tetraploid. So meaning they have twice the normal uh, chromosome count. So American elm hybridization with say resistant species has been very difficult. And there is some effort to grow American elm because it's an iconic species, but it's been limited. And Wait, if I could just, can I just comment on one question that I see? So there's one one comment that I see uh, about rock elm being near Maberly on both granitic and uh, calcium bedrock. It's been my experience anyway. Uh, often you'll find uh, on the, on the um, 
the kind of Eastern shield country, say by uh, Tatlock and uh, Maberly, there's, a, I think, a lot of marble and maybe, you know, some calcium sources in shield country. And as you move west towards Denby, uh, you're in kind of more red spruce country, uh, lower pH and rock and slippery elms seem to be more or less gone. So my comment would be, I think there's a lot of interesting geology going on there. And I'm not going to pretend as if I know... Uh, 100% that rock elm will never be found on, uh, say, pure granite uh, rock. But it seems to me when I tend to find it in uh, shield country, it usually is in kind of what seems to me to be marbly areas. Mm. Um, Glenn Hanna has a similar question just about the geography that you would find rock elm in. Um, he, he says, we have many elms on our property. I see many of what I think are rock elms. Um, he'll go for a walk tomorrow to see what the others are. Um, and he's asking, are they also known as swamp elms? We are on the edge of a granite area with limestone around. Um, he says that they also have lots of sugar maples, but that the elms are doing well. So that that comment that does sound like they're they're uh, the forest that's being described there sounds like a rock elm kind of place and slippery elm too. So limestone, sugar bush, that sort of thing. But I would say regarding the question, is rock elm referred to as swamp elm? It's actually kind of the opposite. So rock, land, rock elm is an upland species preferring, not swamps. The, the, the wettest I've ever seen it grow on is uh, maybe the top of the uh, edge of a stream on kind of a heavy clay. But it doesn't seem to do well or even exist in saturated ground. Whereas American elm prefers saturated ground, mm -hmm. say along streams and swampy lowlands. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting where you can find different species, different um, telltale signs of, of the habitat and ecosystem. Um, and Andrea has a question here um, about zigzag sawfly. Um, she was just wondering if you could speak a little bit more about it. Uh, will it fully defoliate mature trees for seasons on end? On end? Does it target more than just elm species? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So again, I, I'd love to give a long talk on that someday, perhaps if there's the opportunity to do it. But so what we're seeing right now is, um, so we know it's defoliated uh, a population in an entire region, it looks like, at Cornwall this year. So uh, that's concerning. That's the first time that's been observed in North America, or at least in uh, Canada, shall we say. In North Carolina, it's actually been observed to defoliate elms too, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. But in the Northeast, uh, you know, U.S., Southeast Canada, the first time that's been seen to uh, happen was this year. And it's I think it's too early to really know what's going to happen. I'm hoping for the best and prepared for the worst. Uh, the literature we do have on Elm Zigzag Softly, it invaded Europe about 20 to 25 years ago. And it's known to have caused significant defoliation, some branch death in Europe. I don't know what its effect has been on Russian elm, Almus Lavis. Uh, because that's the close relative of American elm. But I can tell you that American elm seems to be a preferred host for, for uh, elm zigzag softly here, meaning I found it easily on American elm uh, since 2021. I didn't see it on slippery elm much at all until this year. And I've never seen it on rock elm until this year, August and later, when I looked hard in the regions where, where American elms had run out of leaves. So it looks like either zigzag soft like doesn't smell rock elms as well or doesn't prefer laying its eggs on them for some reason but it has switched to start using them without significant impact yet so slippery and rock elm it's on them but it seems not to prefer them and has caused no significant effect yet but american elm the first significant effects have been this year so we don't really know what's going to happen unfortunately we'll see how how things continue on um Related to um, Sig Seg Sawfly, Eric had a comment here that um, he's also observed gypsy moth, aka spongy moth, um, love to de defoliate all species of elms, um, and that he's going to keep his eye open for Sig Seg Sawfly now. So thank you. That's great. Thank you for doing that. I do recommend people, if you, uh, especially if you're in other parts of Ontario, uh, we don't really know the range that's been invaded so far very well. I can tell you on iNaturalist that it's been popping up in recent weeks, Guelph, Hamilton, and uh, what was the other place? Kitchener area, I think, too. And uh, I did find it in Toronto in June. For all we know, it could be 
moving uh, northwest also into southern Ontario. And it's subtle in the early stages. So if you're not really looking for it, you're probably not going to see it until the elms are defoliated, unless you're looking fairly carefully. So I think we don't really know exactly where it is yet. And that's something that I recommend anyone who's interested to look for. Thanks, Owen. Um, Stu also had a, had a question fairly early on. Um, he said, as I understand it, the reason American elm is the fence row tree on farms is because cows don't eat it. Um, are you familiar with that and have any information? Yeah, that's a, that's a very great comment. So I don't have, like, I'm not a, I guess I'm not a real farmer per se these days. So I don't have a ton of direct experience on fodder for, wild, for uh, livestock. But the literature is full of examples of, I'm going to say, across the elm genus uh, being used for fodder generally. And like I said, a human starvation food too. So I don't know, that could be, but I would also say one reason why American elm is the fence row tree is it was very adaptable to invade fence rows. So in Eastern Ontario, much of the fence rows after the original forests were cleared were dominated by American elm because I think it's very adaptable and weedy. Also green ash, Fraxinus pennsylvanica. And interestingly, both of those species have been badly affected by, of course, Dutch elm disease and now emerald ash borer. So I don't know about the connection or lack of connection regarding feeding it to cows, but the literature anyway seems to suggest casually that it probably is edible unless there's direct literature saying that it isn't. <laughs> Which I, I, I'm ignorant to that fact either way. Something we can look into a little bit more. Um, and then uh, Stu also had a comment about um, that whenever he cut slippery elm that has died for firewood, for firewood that the uh, bark tends to slide off in sheets. Yeah, indeed. So yeah, yeah. Slippery elm is, uh, I didn't get much chance to talk about the bark really tonight, but uh, slippery elm, of course, famous for medicinal bark. It can be used in poultices for compression to wounds to imp improve human health generally. And the bark is full of a substance uh, often kind of, kind of called uh, casually mu mucilage, right? Like a, a, a mucousy, slimy substance. That's where the name slippery comes from, is from the bark, the inner bark. And indeed, it seems to slide off the tree fairly easily compared to maybe uh, rock and slippery, rock and American elm when they die. Although when they're dead for a while, it also comes off the other two native species too, if they're dead for some time. Mm, that's interesting. Um, one final question here from Tim. Um, he's asking if red elm propagates by rhizomes in, in a hardwood forest. Yes. Um, yes. That's a great okay. question. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I saw it when I meant to get that one. So indeed, if you, if you saw, if I showed, if you saw earlier, uh, again, you can check on YouTube later. I showed a photo of a shade suppressed slippery elm on the left. And then on the right, there was a kind of just a understory slippery elm. I think I described it as indeed. It seems to me, although slippery elm does not root sucker the same way as rock elm, it, it is shade tolerant and kind of spreads as like a solar panel along the ground if it can. And I do think it seems to root sort of like, you know, how black spruce roots and makes new black spruces in bogs. It seems like as if the, if the, the branches spread along the ground in a rhizome, rhizome kind of fashion and they get under leaf litter and things like that, they seem to root and propagate essentially or spread anyway in a, in a rhizome like fashion. Yeah. Excellent. Um, I'm, I'm so impressed, Owen. You must be so well read to have um, put this presentation together and answer all those questions on the fly. It's it's no easy task, but um, you're clearly very passionate about the, the, the uh, this topic and it really, really comes through. It's been a really great presentation. Thanks so much for inviting me and I hope everyone had a good time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, while we just still have a couple more participants on the line, I just wanted to um, point people towards the chat. Um, thankfully, the Ontario Woodlot Association is able to put on these presentations due to occasionally government grants related to the topic, but in this case, um, by the generous donations of folks who are interested in these subjects. Um, so if you're able to contribute a donation to keep the webinars free, um, you can do so through the Eastern Ontario Model Forest. Um, which is the charitable arm um, and other organization that's joined to the hip of the Ontario Woodlot Association. The link there is in the chat. Uh, we also included a link for the upcoming webinar for Oakwilt, which will be in partnership with Lalamand Plant Care. That'll be November 16th, a lunchtime chat. Um, if you're not able to make it at that time, 
we will also be recording that that webinar as well to put to share on YouTube later. Um, speaking of YouTube, um, this webinar will also be shared on YouTube in the next couple of days. Um, and you can also catch Owen's Red Spruce webinar on YouTube as well from back from February. Um, the last thing I'd like folks to um, I'd like to encourage folks to do. If you are interested in following what the Ontario Woodlot Association and Eastern Ontario Model Forest has to share about forests and woodlands in the area, you can subscribe to our monthly newsletter um, and follow us on social media. Um, with that, I think we can call it a night. Um, so thank you so much, Owen. Um, we really appreciate you coming out and we hope everybody enjoyed and learned, learned quite a bit from the webinar tonight. Thanks, everybody. Take care, everyone.